Testing. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our channel. My name is Garrett Dostel, and I'm the New York City brand ambassador for Hiatus Tequila. And thank you for joining our channel. I'm sorry my microphone was off. That's why I'm redoing my introduction. Uh, but today we will be doing a nice little uh, history of Tequila 101, and it'll kind of tell you the story of how tequila became the popular spirit that it is today. So it looks like our stream is all set up and ready to go. So let's go ahead and get started, friends. Tequila. That's why we're all here, right? So, first of all, I'm talking about tequila. I always like to preface with what tequila is. Not that you don't know, I'm sure that everyone here knows what tequila is, but it's always nice to have a little bit of a background to it. So, tequila is an alcoholic beverage from Mexico, and it's fermented from the Blue Weber agave plant. And it's protected by something called an appellation of origin. And what that does is it denotes what it is, where it can be made, and who can make it. And in this case, it can only be made from Blue Weber agave, and it can only be produced in five specific regions of Mexico. Jalisco, Guanajuato, Michoacan, Nayarit, and uh, Tamilupes. Um, and it's monitored and regulated by an organization called the CRT. And the CRT is the Consejo de Regulatory del Tequila, and they're active in every part of the tequila industry. What they do is they help regulate the industry and make sure that it's safe and clean and upholding a common standard across the board when it comes to tequila. One thing that they don't do is tell you if it's good tequila or not inside the bottle. They just let you know that it is tequila, so it follows all the rules and regulations, but just because it's regulated by the CRT isn't a promise that it's going to be a good product. And we all know that there's some rather harsh tequilas out there, um, but if you've ever had hiatus, we're not one of them. We're very sippable and very smooth. Um, the last thing with tequila is it must follow something called the NOM006. So in Mexico, the NOM is the Norma Oficial Mexicano, and all that means is law. So in tequila, it must follow this specific law, which dictates everything that is tequila. So what is tequila? Well, it's an alcoholic beverage that we all know, we love, and we tend to consume. Uh, you know, sometimes we like to do shots of it, sometimes with salt, with lime, and sometimes by itself. Um, but a really nice tequila tends to be sippable. You know, there's a lot of American-made tequilas out there on the market with an American palate, and those actually are custom curated and crafted for us, you know, outside of Mexico, and especially in the U.S., out of all of the product that's exported from Mexico, the U.S. actually drinks roughly 80% of all that is exported from Mexico of their tequila, like quantity. So we are by far their largest market. So they custom design flavors for us. And when we started becoming very uh, familiar with that astringent burn, the as I call it, it kind of became the overwhelming popular want of tequila. So they started changing the recipes for it. But in reality, true Mexican tequila, very much like hiatus, it's herbaceous, it's smooth, it's almost botanical in its nature, and it's able to be sipped and enjoyed, and it doesn't really have that astringent string. Uh, so if you've never had a real Mexican tequila, I do hope and pray and suggest that you go try a true Mexican tequila sometime, and it might just change your perspective, you know? You might not be a tequila drinker, but I've turned many a tequila drinker onto hiatus, and many people who don't drink tequila onto it as well, and they become diehard fans because it really is different. It's very smooth, it's approachable, and it's, uh, it's very nice. So my friends, just a little bit about who we are really quick. So my name is Garrett, and like I said, I'm the New York brand ambassador for a company called Hiatus Tequila. It's a new little company. It was launched in 2019, and it has only been out for a very short period of time, but it's taken the market by storm, and it's in very limited markets. It's in New York, it's in Florida, it's in Missouri, but at the same time, it's growing across the nation, and it's becoming more popular, and you can also order it all over the country. Here in a little bit, I'm going to put up into the chat um, exactly what the phone number is that you can order it at, um, but you can just call in and order it, or you can go to our website, and you can also buy it there, um, that, or they can direct you to the stores closest to you where you can purchase it. Um, but it's a very Mexican forward style of tequila. Our owner, Christopher DeSoto, he wanted to move away from the concept of having a juice in the bottle that's made for Americans, but branded with this Mexican branding on the outside with mariachi bands and skeletons. But in the essence of the tequila itself, it doesn't represent Mexico. It's more of an American product in that context with that astringent burn. So he really made it more of an American bottle and put a real Mexican tequila inside of it. So as you see our bottles here, they're very simplistic. They're almost like snow globes. They reflect the purity of the fruit. And that's really what we go for at Hiatus. We have zero additives across the board. We are an all-natural product, and we know exactly where agave comes from, and we monitor it every step of the way to make sure that it's as clean as possible, with no artificial ingredients, and that we can get the best tequila in your hands that we possibly can. And we're very proud of that fact. 
And I personally, as a brand ambassador, am very proud to be able to work for a company that I can actually say that and not lie to you about it and tell the honest to God truth. So my friends, let's talk tequila. So a brief history of tequila. So where did tequila come from? Well, we just talked about tequila coming from Mexico. So first and foremost, tequila must have come from Mexico originally, right? And it did, indeed. So tequila has been around for a very long time, or at least in the essence of it. It might not have been the pure spirit that you know today, but it has taken many, many forms over the years to get to tequila, as many things do. You know, prior to fermentation, we were drinking wines and beers, and we were drinking low ABV things, just like in Mexico. So tequila really starts in the beginning with uh, the pre-Hispanic Mexico. So in pre-Hispanic Mexico, um, to set the groundwork, you know, agave, it really comes from the word agavos, meaning notable or admirable, and it is an alcohol like beverage made from agave, and it really dates back to ancient times. Um, a lot of people think of agave coming from mid-century forward when tequila was being distilled, but in reality, its true essence goes all the way back down, back to the time of the Mayans and before. And in that time, tequila was drank as a very important social and religious role in the community. You know, today people are very, um, very conservative with their beliefs when it comes to alcohol and spirits, and it's not used as almost a religious practice or a social practice. You know, we'll go out to a bar and get a drink and hang out with friends, which is a social practice, but you don't really see it being used for church ceremonies or celebrations, um, but it is used at weddings. So in a context, it kind of does tie back in the same aspect. But back then, I will say, they were probably much, much more heavy on their intoxication levels than we are today. We're a little bit more modest on what we're putting in our body and how much. Um, but it was so important to them. They even would present it to their gods as gifts, uh, like my Hoel. Um, and it just shows what a notable role that this spirit has held in these communities leading up until today. When, for us, it's a more common modern thing when we think of the spirit as opposed to almost this religious context or this beautiful products that can be delivered to the God as a gift. Before agave was ever drank though, agave was being used. You know, just like any good farmer, they use what they have on their land. So agave was used for multiple purposes and practices. First, it was the salvia of the agave was used for medicine. And in case you don't know salvia, if you've ever thought of an aloe vera plant, you know, when you use aloe vera for like sunscreen or to help stop a sunburn, it's that thick goopy substance inside the leaves of a, the aloe cactus, and that's the salvia. And agave tend to have a very similar quality of salvia to it, and it can be extracted the same way. I'm not saying go cut down an agave plant and use it like aloe vera, they're different. But in this context, they were using salvia for many, many medical purposes back then. You know, that uh, pre-medical revolution kind of, you know, artisanal, do-it-at-home style medicine. Um, agave was also used for tools. Uh, and what they would do is, for one, they would make sewing needles out of it. So they would take the agave leaves, they would cut out the center, and they would leave the spiky, sharp point at the end, and they would tie the string or twine to the backside, and they would use it to sew. You know, agave, the leaves themselves, the middle part, was used especially for sandals and for clothing. Um, they would also dry the agave leaves, and they would turn it into rope by braiding it together, much like the manila industry does. And they would also use it for thatching on the roofs of their houses. You know, in these pre-colonial civilizations, a lot of times we see these pictures of these big Mayan temples, and the temples did exist, but not everyone lived in a temple. You know, the temple was for the gods, it was the celebratory place. So there tends to be, you know, smaller civilizations outside around that are almost huts with these thatched roofs and these smaller things. And the agave tended to be used a lot for that, to do the thatching of it. Um, they would even use the dried leaves as fire starters, uh, because the agave itself, it doesn't have a lot of moisture because it is a succulent. Um, it holds all the moisture almost in the center of the plant. You know, the piña, the part that's actually used to make tequila, it holds most of the moisture. So the leaves themselves, once they're dried, it's really easy to dry them out. And then you could be using it as a fire starter because there's not a lot of moisture. And in these civilizations, when you think of these arid desert climates, there's also not a lot of trees. So this is actually a really good alternative and substitute to be able to be used. Um, and then they would also use the agave ash after they would burn agave for soap. And this has been known throughout history to be used, that ash can be used to help clean and help remove oil. Um, but before it was drank, we did this. And then the miraculous happened. And historians really do believe that they discovered that around um, 200 CE is when agave was first fermented into any form of beverage. 
Now, this doesn't mean we're making tequila yet, but we will get there. Uh, this means that we're making very light ABV beverages, kind of like a beer per se, you know, something where the agave is left out in the sun and then it starts to ferment naturally with the yeast and the bacteria. And then you do have a beverage that has alcohol containing to it, but it's very low ABV. We're not quite to tequila yet, but and we're talking about 200 CP. So here we go, my friends. This is gonna be a lot of timeline in this presentation, but I hope that I can talk and entertain and then keep you enjoying the presentation as we go along with it. So the beginning of time of tequila. I want to credit the beginning of the time of tequila with 200 CE, when we first believed that it was discovered that tequila can be fermented, because this fermentation process is what started everything moving forward. And yes, tequila could have been made in the future after this was discovered and people could have found it, but we found it a long time ago. And I'm very proud of the fact that the pre-Aztec civilizations and the pre-Spanish civilizations of Mexico were able to come up with their own beverage and have it last so long. So we're talking about agave can be fermented in 200 CE, but in around 500 to 600 CE, this is when the first Nahuatl speaking tribes really settled Mexico. And this is about the sixth century. And the Nahuatl tribes are the tribes that spoke the language of the Aztecs. We're talking about the people who are settling to become the Aztecs, the pre-Aztecs per se. Um, the people who are settling the tribe and the lands, these are uh, the more, um, the native people of the land prior to the big cities and civilizations being built and put together, which would be more like the Aztec Empire, um, which doesn't come too much longer after. And in 1320 CE is when we're really talking about the Aztecs. And the Aztecs are the people who really, really, really got agave on its foot. Um, and the, found, uh, the founding of uh, Tenechtitlan in uh, 1320, you know, it really created the rise of um, uh, excuse me, uh, my contacts are getting dry. Um, Actili Poliki, which is uh, the first form of an agave beverage, very similar to pulque. Um, and in case you don't know what pulque is, it's a fermented beverage from agave. And what they do is you cut the agave and you wound. Sorry, my friends, we just got disconnected, making sure that we're reconnected. Perfect. Sorry, guys. We're back and reconnected. It looks like everything's good to go. So, pulque. Pulque is, uh, they would take that, the cactus, they would score it, and they'd create almost a bowl at the top, and they would cover it. And then overnight and over time, the agave would push juice up there to try to heal that wound. And in doing so, that juice would then be collected, and it would be allowed to sit out and ferment with the natural yeast in the environment. And that would create a very low ABV beverage, much like beer. And it's called pulque. And pulque you can still get today, but um, this Actili Poliki was the first form of pulque. It was the original form of an agave distillate, and it really became popular with the Aztecs because then it came more of the farming, the harvesting, and more of the civiliz civilization to be able to support, you know, the actual production of an agave industry. But prior to that, they still had plenty of beverages. So Mexico has been through many, a many, a many beverages. They are a very sustainable people when it comes to their drink. And here is a long list of things that happened prior to agave, leading up to agave being distilled. So prior to agave, um, they did have corn, they had maize, and it's a huge part of the Mexican society and also their culture. And so they would make atole, which was a non-alcoholic beverage, um, when they would take ground corn and dissolve it in water and would make almost a milky substance, and this would be atole. And then they would make balache, which is like sweetened with corn and anise, which is another form of this atole. Or they'd make a bate, which is made from water and chan seeds. Or a bingarat, which is a distilled beverage made from uh, binge. And as you can see, there's a lot, a lot of different beverages. And they're very resourceful. So these ancient societies would take almost any fruit or seed or anything they had available to them. And they would find a way to turn it into a beverage or a spirit. And there were so many of them. They had charape and tapache. They had chicha. Um, they had gilatole, um, which is another fermented corn. They had charote, uh, which is again another corn. They had pozo, which is um, another corn-esque substance. Um, and they had tesquino, which is more of a beer. And this is a germinated maize. So this is almost like the concept of pulque, where the agave ferments into a low ABV, but with corn. 
Um, so they kind of, prior to agave, they used corn for a lot of their spirits, as you can see. And they would either make a non-alcoholic version, which kind of just added texture and flavor, or they would allow it to ferment. And they would turn it into different ways by adding different ingredients, different spices, different elements. You know, they were very resourceful. You saw that they were adding anise or tree bark to make a little subtle change here, a little subtle change there. Um, here on the charrote, they would mix it with toasted cacao seeds to give a little bit of a chocolatey note to it. You know, it was a very industrious society, these people. Um, but finally, after corn, the next big thing that was on the mark would be agave. And that's with the rise of the Aztecs, really. And um, that would come, and you can make pulque. And pulque would be an alcoholic beverage, and it's made from the agave juice. And like I said, you drill a hole in the center, and then it fills with liquid, and that liquid is called alguamil, or uh, sweet nectar, or uh, honey water. And then it would be collected and allowed to ferment. And in prehistoric times, um, priests would use a lot of these in ceremonies. Like I said earlier, that um, the religious ceremony, as well as the social like context, a lot of spirits were used in Mexican societies. And so when it got to agave, it was a perfect drink to go hand in hand, especially with the climate. It's much easier to grow these big cactuses, sorry, they're not actually cactuses, but these big desert succulents that um, don't require a lot of upkeep and that are easy to find than it is to have to manage and constantly maintain and all the time and water and effort that go into growing maize and corn, which is more of a food substance. So it kind of makes a great replacement. Um, but it was available and they learned how to ferment roughly around 200 CE. But it wasn't really until the industrial times of kind of like the Aztec Empire where it really became a huge, huge, huge popular big hit to be working with a guy. I'm not saying they didn't. I'm just saying that's when it really rose to fruition. So in that context of the Aztecs setting forth agave, the history of tequila kind of comes to a front at the Aztecs. Um, that's when most of the mythology and the rumors of how tequila was founded and when it came, kind of came about. Uh, any previous history was found through, you know, written records or pots or that kind of like, and, um, the kind of archaeology aspect of history. Whereas here we have more of like written expression that's very easily found that has been passed down through generation and the history has been maintained and not just discovered. So with tequila in the Aztec civilization, there were two really big main thoughts of how tequila came to be. And these are the two like prevailing mainstream, you know, topics of what they are. One was the gods gave people agave and the other was the legend of the red. And so let's go ahead and get into these a little bit. And these are part of my favorite part of this presentation. It's always great to hear mythology. It's always exciting. It's a really wonderful story. So, um, yeah, let's dive in. So first, the gods. So in Aztec mythology, the world was created. And when the world was created, there was a, go a goddess named Tzitzimito. And she was the goddess of darkness. And she would go up into the sky and eat all of the light. She would eat the light. And the world would become dark. Well, one day, Quetzalcoatl, the god of creation, got so tired of living in this dark, desolate place, the earth was dark, the sky was dark, that he decided that he wanted to ascend to the heavens and look to destroy Tsitsimito to help... Alright, we should be back connected, sorry about that. Alright, friends, let me start over. Um, sorry that we're having... Alright, looks like we're back up and running. Sorry about that, friends. And I don't know if it's really cutting in or out, but I'm definitely seeing that it is on my side and all my studio, so I'm just trying to make sure that we can get through the presentation. So, um, so Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl decides to go up into the sky to slay uh, Tzitzimito, um, to bring back light. And so, he does. He goes up into the sky, and on his way, Quetzalcoatl, while looking for Tzitzimito, uh, bumps into my Joel, the go uh, granddaughter of Tzitzimito, who was imprisoned by Tzitzimito. And so Quetzalcoatl takes it upon himself, and instead of slaying Tzitzimito, decides to take the god granddaughter back down to Earth, and he falls in love with her. So he decides to liberate her from his, her grandmother's tyranny, and they run away, back down to Earth. And Maihoel runs away with Quetzalcoatl. They descend from the heavens. And in doing so, Tzitzimito gets upset and realizes that Maihoel is gone, and she gets furious. So she decides to come back down to the Earth, to take back my Hoel. And then epic search goes on, looking for my Hoel from Tzitzimito, and a big battle ensues. And during so, uh, Quetzalcoatl transforms himself into a tree and my Hoel into a bush to hide. But Tzitzimito finds them, and in this battle, ends up accidentally killing my Hoel. Now, she returns back to the sky, 
and Quetzalcoatl buries the remains of his lover. And he's heartbroken, and he laments his lost lover. So he wants to get revenge for her death. So he flies back up into the sky and kills the evil Tzitzi Mito, and in doing so, brings light back to the earth, which was his original goal. But in doing so, he also lost his love. A beautiful agave plant started to grow upon the site where Maya Will rested, and it was pointed with leaves to protect her tomb, roughly 400 thorns. And the 400 thorns represent the 400 breasts that Maya Will had. Yes, Maya Will had 400 breasts. So Quetzalcoatl liked her for multiple reasons, I'm sure. And uh, Quetzalcoatl returned from heaven after killing Tzitzi Mito, bringing sunshine back to the earth, and every single night he would lament on her grave. Quetzalcoatl would descend from the heavens and cry on the grave of Mahawa. So the other gods, they decided to take pity on him. And where, on the spot where Mahawel died, they decided to endow the plant, the agave, with a gift to comfort men with the 400 rabbits of drunkenness. And from then on, any time Quetzalcoatl would visit the agave, if he would drink from the nectar of Mahawel, the actual cactus she was turned into, he would be relieved of his suffering, his pain, and he would be comforted. And in Mexico, the 400 gods of rabbits are known as the gods of inebriation. And the belief is that when you drink, you don't get drunk. When you drink, you become embodied by one of these spirits, one of these 400 gods of inebriation. And so the 400 gods are the children of Mahawel, and they feed off her 400 breasts. And so this agave plant symbolizes Mahawel, and Quetzalcoatl comes down every night to drink from it to find relief and comfort for him suffering. Now, this is the story of the gods. It's a great story. I love these big, very verbose, you know, voluptuous stories of mythology. Um, the next story, which is the Legend of the Ray, is a, is a little more subtle. It's, uh, it's not quite as loud and vivid and vivacious, but it's still a great story. So the alternative perspective, instead of having Quetzalcoatl and Tzitzi Mitel and Maya Well all fighting in an epic battle of love and romance, and this big tryst creating this beautiful plant to give the gift of comfort and relief to mankind in the form of agave and tequila. The other one is the Legend of the Ray. And the Legend of the Ray is a little bit simpler. It goes like this. So, Aztecs allegedly first discovered the predecessor to what we know as the plants of tequila, which we're talking pulque here, um, when lightning struck an agave plant. So, one day, lightning struck, struck, strikes an agave, and if you've ever been in an agave distillery, there's an aroma, there's a pungent aroma that comes with it of the cooked agave. It's very sweet. It's very nectarous. It's very wild. It's very boastful. It's very strong. And so when this agave got struck by lightning, it was cooked. And the piña, this sweet fermented fragrance that's very, very, very overwhelming, people stumbled upon and found it with the fermented juices held inside from sitting out inside the sun for too long. And they tasted the juice and the nectar, and they realized that this is amazing and wonderful. And thus it said that it's possibly that tequila was developed by this way, that the people weren't gifted tequila by the gods, but instead they stumbled upon it when the lightning struck an agave and opened it up and split it in half. And then throughout the day, the agave fermented until someone found it. And there's lots of other stories that go like this when it comes to the origination of the tequila. But these are the two main ones that have been passed down generation after generation throughout history. Um, other brands and companies have all so created their own. Sometimes you'll hear a story of a woman getting lost in the desert and the only way to survive, you know, uh, the gods pointed her to the agave cactus and that happened. Or you'll hear stories of like an animal, like one of the 400 rabbits, like a rabbit um, being drunk out in the desert and someone following the rabbit to see why it's so joyous and stumbling into an agave plant that had been over fermented and that they could then enjoy. But these are the two really well-known, documented, that have been passed down through history, ways that tequila came to be, all the way back from the ancient Aztec times. And I think it's a great story of Mahawel and uh, Quetzalcoatl and their love story. Um, and The Legend of the Ray is great too. It's probably the more realistic version, that a lightning struck an agave, cooked the agave, and someone stumbled upon it, tasted it, and was like, yo, this is awesome. And thus originated kind of like the younger version of tequila, the pulque that we talked about, that ferments beverage. So, the Aztec civilization, we're talking 1320 CE, it's running, it's popular, they're drinking the uh, pulque, um, becomes more popular in familiarity as well, and then everything was perfectly fine in Mexico until about 1520. And in 1520 CE, that is when Spain came over to Mexico and invaded. 
And this invasion of Mexico, what it did is it brought the importation of wine and spirits from Spain, but it also brought with them alembic stills and the distillation process that the Spaniards know in their cognac making production process. Um, and this also allowed them to create the true mezcal wines, which is the, the realm of tequila now. So prior to this, contextually, it's said that the ancient Aztecs didn't make high-proof beverages. They didn't have the ability to distill to high proofs. And this is a little bit uh, controversial, and some people will debate here and there. Um, but the information that I'm pulling from is pulling directly from the CRT as well as the Spirits Wine Educator Association like handbook. Um, so we're going to go with that. Um, but it's saying that in 1520s, the first time when the Spaniards came over, that they were able to teach the natives how to make these distilled beverages of high proof. Because prior to then, they didn't have the stills needed to do so. And in making a high-proof beverage, you have to distill multiple times. Because each time you distill, you're increasing the proof of the, the beverage. So tequila has to be distilled twice. It can be distilled more, but at least twice. The first distillate only gets to about 13% ABV. And when you think of just generic fermentation, you're talking between like 3% to 7% alcohol in content. So you're talking more of like beer fermentation with just generic open air fermentation. And then once you use a still, then you can actually start raising that volume. And in tequila with the double distillation is when you get between that 35 to 55% ABV required to be tequila. So that actually is kind of accredited to the Spaniards coming over and invading. And once they took over Mexico, obviously, you know, they did the missionaries and they kind of took over the people and they kind of informed them and taught them about um, everything that they knew in their civilization. And in doing so, with really came the distillation process. And so when the Spaniards came over, um, the other thing they did was they founded towns. And one of the towns that was founded is a, a town that I think we all know. It's a wonderful little town called Tequila in the state of Jalisco. Um, and the town of Tequila is actually where Tequila gets its name from is that the mezcal wines around that region became so popular that they decided to name the beverage after it, um, after tequila. Now, the Spaniards, not all good things came to the Spaniards. You know, there was a lot of things when it came to the Spaniards, you know, when it came to religious practices and it came to persecution and stuff along that. We're not going to get into all the heavy details about that. We're talking more about tequila. But one of the things that was more of a negative that came with Spaniards is that it came with an uh, imperial rule. So instead of being a civilization ruled internally from their own, they were being ruled from a country afar. And with that came in 1785 and 1789 the banning of tequila. Um, reason being is that when the Spaniards came over here, they saw it kind of as a profit conquest. You know, the conquistadors came over looking for gold, looking for money, looking for ways to expand their empire. And in doing so, they brought over their wine and their cognac. And they were hoping to be able to sell to these new civilizations their wines and cognacs. Um, but the civilizations were very different, especially in the mindset. And they had to learn the new languages, and they had to learn the mentality, and they had to grow into that kind of civilized, quote-unquote, perspective of the new empire as opposed to their own internal civilization. Um, so in, 18, in 1785 to 1789, King Charles III, he bans the production of tequila and mezcal wines. Reason being is in banning the production of tequila and mezcal, he's hoping that these natives will start buying the stuff that the Spanish is trying to trade and import with them, um, which will help increase money flow into Mexico, as well as tax revenue. Because you can't really tax a beverage that's made somewhere else that has no one kind of regulating and monitoring how much is being made, how much is being sold. Um, so in this context, they're able to kind of tax and move more money back to Spain. But as you can see very quickly, um, this is the only period of history I will say that in Mexico, once tequila was created, tequila no longer existed. Um, because very shortly, only about four years later in 1792, um, the new king, King Ferdinand IV, uh, he really quickly turned this around. And he allowed the legal production of mezcal wines because the people weren't happy in Mexico. And on top of that, they weren't actually able to collect those tax dollars they were hoping they could because once again, there was no one there to regulate it. Um, so he opened back up the industry in Mexico to be able to make the products that they wanted. And on top of that, it made their soldiers much happier because the soldiers have now became acclimated to this new palate and taste and they wanted tequila. And so it was able to keep the Spaniards in Mexico more happy as well. And this also allowed tequila to start being produced and shipped outside of the region where it was originally grown in the state of Jalisco around the town of tequila. Tequila, as it's known, the blue weber agave varietal that was made in that region, started spreading out. Now, all over Mexico, they were making agave beverages and distillates um, within different societies, but for the most part, they weren't making it the way that they were in tequila. And that's why it has its own name and its own designation. 
So King Ferdinand opens back up, allows tequila to happen, and then wonderful things happen. Um, in 1795, still under imperial rule, um, we finally get our first tequila license. So this is the first ability of the Spanish government to do what they had been hoping for all along, which is to get money back for anything that they're doing in a new world. So in licensing tequila, they're able to finally start getting their tax dollar back. And as you can see, there was a big struggle for it. They wanted that tax dollar, but it was hard for them to find a way to do so. But the way that they found to do so was to legally license distilleries. And the first one went to Jose Maria Guadalupe Cuervo. A very popular name that a lot of us may know, and I hope a lot of us do. Um, it's on a lot of bottles, and it's become a very popular name in tequila. Um, Cuervo, yeah. So the first who was legally licensed was Cuervo. It's not saying that they're the first who have produced tequila. It's just the first to make an arrangement and agreement with the Spanish government to be able to do so. Now, the next big thing, after Cuervo was making tequila, other people started making tequila. Tequila became popular. People were drinking tequila. Little tequila saloons were popping up around hotels and in towns all over where you could drink and eat and these cantinas. Um, but the next big thing that happens kind of with tequila comes with the the unrest inside of Mexico. You know, a foreign power came over, took over, ruled the land, you know, hurt the people, built a new built a new kind of civilization with it, and now the people want to be set free again because now they want to have their own power and their own integrity. Um, so this comes with the Mexican independence. And in 1821, Spain, uh, Mexico actually was able to get their independence from Spain. And in doing so, Spanish liquors started to face greater difficulties reaching Mexico. You know, they're no longer part of the empire. There's no reason to really run ships over there if there's going to be no money coming back to the empire. So it became much more difficult to get any kind of trade route established. Um, so what this did, though, was it gave tequila producers a wonderful opportunity. Because in losing the ability to, to get cognac and wine, the people staying in Mexico, who are still of Spanish descent, want to continue their beverage drinking and partaking. And this opened up the ability for the tequila producers to increase their sales, especially in Guadalajara which is outside of the town of tequila, not that far, so they're starting to spread out. But what it also did is it allowed tequila to really start marketing themselves and really start selling the concept of tequila, this blue ever agave beverage, coming from this small little town and push all the way into Mexico City and all the way into the center of the country, where in the past it was more of a regionalized beverage. Um, this lack of liquor really gave the opportunity for these distillers who have started to upcome and start making their product to really kind of push out and take over the market. Um, because other people were making it, but they're making it in very small quantities, at home for themselves typically, not for sale and mass production. But the distillers like Cuervo, they got on board in the Salsa family and that kind of thing, and really got the, the ball rolling in kind of producing that commercialized version of tequila and getting it into people's hands. So, once again, tequila's still growing, you know, and great opportunities are happening. This, this really creates a demand for tequila. Um, so there's more people coming into the market to make tequila, to help the, the, uh, satiate that. And then the next big thing that happens in tequila is in 1857, um, the Mexico Civil War. So this war was, once again, it came with the unrest. So Spain set Mexico free, but Mexico, in theory, was still kind of ruled by the same people who came there originally, who had taken over to begin with. And the Mexican citizens weren't very happy with that because they were still treating them as like lower class citizens. And there was a distant and like a separation inside of the government of these different types of people. And so Mexico really wanted to be their own country and change how they were being ruled. And so what they did is this war really ended the old social order that was inherited by the Spanish domain over the people in the Aztecs and moved into more of that Mexican mentality and kind of allowed them to become their own people. And what this did, though, is the tequila producers were very smart during this time. Tequila producers have always been very smart, and they always will be. Tequila will always exist, I challenge you. And I could be wrong one day, and I hope it, on my grave that I'm not. But the tequila producers, during this time, had to decide, who are they going to side with? Are they going to side with the current regime, who's making the laws and the legislation? Or are they going to side with the people who could be taking over into the new regime, and may be able to open up some of the rules and the capacities for them to be able to make their product? And that's exactly what they did. So the tequila industry almost as a whole sided with the liberals, and in doing so, it put them on a very strong front. So if the war moved forward and won like they thought it would, then tequila would be able to have a better uphold in making laws and legislation and regulating and helping protect their product. And that's exactly what happened. And in 1867, when the liberals did win the war, um, a distinguished tequila producer then assumed the governorship of the state of Jalisco. Hmm, look at that. 
tequila, as you can see, they're very industrious people. And they're more and more being made, more and more people making tequila, but they're also talking to each other. And they're keeping each other apprised. And when the governor takes over the state of Jalisco, this puts them in a very opportunistic perspective to be able to help legislate and regulate and move forward with what they're trying to do and with their product. Um, and this happened when they were able to finally defeat the French whom Napoleon sent in um, in support of the Spanish conservatives. Um, yes, the French were in Mexico. And most people, every time I tell the story, they'll be like, the French, where did they come from? I'm not telling the whole history of Mexico, I'm telling you the history of tequila. But when they got into the war with Spain, the Spaniards did help support the people who were staying in Mexico and sent over troops, as well as France sending over troops to help support their Spanish allies. Now, once again, look at the dates. So, in 1867, and it didn't take long for tequila to get its name. And in 1873, tequila finally gets its name. The very specific type of tequila being made in the region of tequila, around the town of tequila, governed by a man who makes tequila, was able to create a name for this mezcal beverage that was made in this region of Jalisco. And it was officially named by law um, to distinguish itself from separate spirits, tequila. And this happened in 1873. So we're talking all the way from 200 CE when agave could first be distilled all the way into the 1800s. We're talking 1600 years it took to finally get to have the actual name tequila. But all the way along the line, you can see how it was building in the Mexican mentality and in the culture that tequila was becoming more popular and more prevalent, um, especially with their local beverages and with the Spanish pushback, which made the tequila industry grow even more. And with the legislation pushes and with the people being able to get advantage like positions within the government, um, there was a whole history that led up to tequila. Tequila didn't just happen. It's not that someone stumbled upon tequila. It was really a part of the culture and the heritage that had been developed over a long period of time. It was long coming. So, in 1873, boom, we finally have tequila. Tequila gets its name. And tequila got its name and it stayed that way. And in 1902, uh, tequila was finally classified, or these, these specific plants being used in this region of Jalisco, um, by a botanist named Frederick Albert Constantine Weber. And it was given the botanical name of Agave Tequilenia Weber Azul. So Blue Weber Agave Varietal. Um, and that's the specific category that now today, under the tequila laws, is the only type allowed to be used to make tequila. So prior to this time, tequila could be used made with other products. There was no real regulation or legislation on it. And still at this point, while we're talking, there's no real regulation or legislation except for the fact that saying that there is a beverage called tequila. That's the only really thing there. It's not saying what it's made from or how it's made. It's just that there is a beverage and it's made in this state. And so the people in Jalisco were making tequila and some of them were using different types of agave. But at this point, this is when we finally discover what varietal is the one that works the best. And so roughly in 1902, when this agave gets its name, it's when it becomes more popular, because it was the most popular being used. But at the same time, now it finally has a name. It's, it's more than just the agave plant or the magwe. It's now a specific magwe. It's the Blue Weber Azul magwe. And then um, more political unrest happens. Unfortunately, Mexico had a lot of wars in history and battles and fights um, because it came from a conquered civilization, and it was a constant struggle to be able to be independent and free. And in 1910 to 1920, um, the Mexican Revolution happened, which is once again uh, in more of an internal conflict. And in 1910, they finally were able to overthrow the dictatorship that had been happening for a very long time. So all the way from the, we're talking the previous war till now, we were talking about dictatorships. And people were really ruling, but with their strong foot, and it wasn't much of the society gained input. But the dictator was finally being able to be overthrown. And... In doing so, the whole country now kind of is gaining their own independence and their own perspective and their own personality. And so Mexico is looking to strengthen their sense of their, next, uh, their nationality, of their Mexican heritage, of who they are. And what better way to do so than with a beverage they've been drinking for forever. And it was really aided at this point. You know, it, it's not just Mexico was like, oh, well, tequila's us. You know, it's something they've been drinking, but the no, by no means was it a contextual premise that was tied directly to who they are as a people until roughly the 1930s to 1950s. And in the 1930s, um, Mexican, sorry, Mexico's um, loyalty to tequila was grown. And it was grown actually by the film industry. And a lot of history, if you look at a lot of history, a lot of history actually happens because of film and television and popular media. But in the 1930s, there were a lot of films that started to become popular, like the El Chavos. And these Mexican film industries, what they did is they created a stereotype of people who drank tequila being real Mexicans. 
And in doing so, more people wanted to become real Mexicans, so they really jumped on the bandwagon of drinking tequila, and it became the popular zeitgeist. And this stereotype stuck all the way until today, where we tie now as a cultural identity tequila to the Mexican society. And um, other things did help, because in the 1930s, there was also another flu out there, speaking of flu, um, there was a flu out there called the Spanish Influenza. And the Spanish Influenza was coming about, and it was wiping out a lot of people. Um, very similar to a situation that we know now in days. Uh, but what they would do was back then, they didn't have a lot of cures or remedies. So what they would suggest is that people would drink tequila. And at first it was a joke, but then it actually started getting spread that, you know, you could drink tequila to help cure your cold. And so people would. And if nothing else, even if it didn't cure the cold, it helped stop them thinking about the cold. You know, good tequila always stops you worrying about your problems. Just like my Hawel originated it, and the gods bestowed it upon man that when you drink, you lose your sorrow and your problems. So drinking tequila would help them lose their sorrow and their problems and help them become very happy and positive. So the Spanish influenza, along with the film industry of Mexico, really, really created that tie of the Mexico's identity to tequila as a whole and popularized it across the entire country. And then um, we're talking about the 1940s. And in the 1940s, after the, after the 30s, with the film industry moving in, in the 1940s, we enter into another war, but even a bigger war. We're talking about the World War. We're talking about World War II. And in the 1940s, the U.S. started having an issue getting the supplies that they needed from Europe. And we, being Americans, love to drink, and we didn't have any kind of products, because if you think of the 20s through 30s, we're talking Prohibition, and then we're talking this New World War, and we're back into the spirits industry now at this point, and we want to drink, and now we're having a cutoff of being able to get whiskey from Europe, which whiskey came from Ireland, and it came from Scotland, and it came from Europe. You know, we weren't really making it big here at home yet. Um... And we had a cutoff of supply, so what did we do? Well, tequila exports reached an unexpected level because tequila, the industry, was able to supplant the whiskey supplies and move into that foot and really take over America. So in the, in the 40s is really when tequila started hitting America and really solidifying themselves as a spirit and in the game. And back then it was definitely a different product at a different price point, made a different way. It wasn't this 100% blue, all organic, sustainable stuff we're talking about today. Um, it was a little bit different. You know, at first it was. It was all organic and made the same way that we make it today, pretty much. And then they realized that the supply and demand was so large that they had to kind of change it a bit. And that's when you get what's called the mixtos. Mixto is not really a word in the tequila industry, but it's a word that we kind of know colloquially as like a tequila that's not 100% agave. There's a lot of tequilas out there like that. They're called tequila, not 100% agave tequila. And these tequilas only have to have 51% agave, and they can have 49% of their sugars. And it's really during this time that the rise kind of happened because they had to supplement the supply and fulfill the demand. So they realized that they could use sugar to help offset the sugars in the fermentation process and kind of water down the tequila per se to make it more batching. And that tequila became very popular and it stayed way popular even into the 70s. And it wasn't until like the, tw the 2000s up to 2012 where the other tequila came back into fruition, that all natural, organic, clean, pure, original tequila. I mean, it had always been popular in Mexico, but it wasn't a huge part of the export industry. The export industry kind of found its own niche and kind of moved forward with it. And that's kind of what I talked about in the beginning of this presentation with the American palate tequilas that have kind of come into the zeitgeist and became popular to us. So the 40s is when America got on board. And now today, if you think of tequila supply today, to today America drinks 80% of all the tequila exported from Mexico. And that would never have happened if World War II didn't happen. Because World War II really solidified tequila's stanchion in the United States. Um, now, again, we've had a lot of wars in Mexico. We've had a lot of change of government. We've had a lot of tequila and people coming together to make tequila. Tequila finally got a name. Tequila's becoming a product. Tequila's becoming a whole industry in itself. And at this point, roughly 90 different distilleries really exist making tequila up and running. And in 1949, um, Mexico finally created regulation and laws on tequila. They created the first... Uh, Norma Oficial Mexicano for Tequila, 006. And this first law that was established for tequila really set the groundwork for what tequila is today. And it, it really, like, set the precedence for what tequila is. And it does get updated, and it does change every couple years. Um, the last big change was in 2012, but it's, for the most part, small tweaks. Um, but this is when tequila started becoming regulated and really got a groundwork. And in doing so, in the 1950s, tequila's industry completely revolutionized uh, and got renovated because now you have laws and standards. You can't just be making something randomly in the back of your yard. You can, but you have to make sure you're doing it the right way. So factories are getting cleaned up. 
and also um, hygiene's being improved and the tequila supply chain is being developed. You know, people want tequila and they want to be able to get it to them and this demand that America has, they can almost not keep up with. So this is really when the, the tequila industry went from being, I'm making tequila and selling it myself to how can we make tequila and help support tequila industry. This is the real time when tequila industry developed and became a thing. And so um, during these times when the produ production chain started being like established and there were a lot of technological improvements, you know, people were going to other countries and seeing what they're doing as well with what they're doing in their like distilling methodologies. Um, not just the albumic stills, but now in tequila these days, even copper and uh, pipe stills are being, uh, pot stills as well as uh, column stills are being used to make tequila. And the 50s really kind of changed a lot of perspectives on what is tequila and really established the groundwork for how tequila works. And then the 50s kind of solidified the industry. And then moving into the 1970s, you know, um, the 1970s is when tequila really became the spirit of Mexico. Prior to this point, it was in the culture, it was in the heritage. People knew it came from Mexico, but there was no rules or regulations or laws saying that it can only be made in Mexico. It could be made anywhere. And there were multiple people who saw it being made other places. One of them, for instance, was um, one of the grandfathers of the Sousa family, you know, went to Japan and saw them growing agave. And they're like, wait a minute, this is the drink of Mexico. What are you trying to do here making a distillate with it? And after fighting back and forth, you know, in 1977, finally tequila got what's called its appellation of origin. And we did touch on this very, very briefly in the beginning of this presentation, but let me just recurse to it. So an appellation of origin, what it does is it denotes the region and where a product can be produced. It ties that product to the land and the characteristics and the people that are involved in that process in that region, and it really defines what a product is. So much like champagne in France, where champagne can only be made in the Champagne region, tequila can only be made in specific regions of Mexico, not all of Mexico. It's actually five different regions. The whole state of Jalisco, and then limited municipalities in Guananato, Michoacan, Nayarit, and Tamilupas. Um, but yeah, it was in the 1970s when the official Gazette finally produced this appellation of origin and really made tequila a beverage of Mexico. Not just a beverage that's a part of Mexico, but it's really from Mexico and only can be made in Mexico by Mexicans, regulated by the government. This really like solidified that kind of groundwork. And then um, the next big thing in tequila, moving into 1994, is when tequila really got its regulation and its industry set up and established. Um, in the 50s, they were renovating it, but it was still kind of like freelance, everyone doing their own thing. In the 70s, you get an appellation of origin, which kind of denotes more specifically, you know, what is tequila, you know? And then moving into the 1994, the government realizes that people keep asking for little tweaks on the laws and the legislation here and there to help benefit and better things. And one of the big things was this whole concept of the 100% Dagave tequila. Because there were farmers who wanted to make tequila the old way, but it was very competitive in the industry, and they wanted to denote themselves separately than other tequilas. The whole concept of an appellation of origin, to begin with, is to help protect the integrity of a product and prevent it from becoming colloquialized or watered down. So that every time you have that product, you know it's the exact same style of product, or at least what it is. And it's not, it's not there's no, it could be this or it could be that. It, I mean, it's not necessarily guaranteeing a good quality product, it's just saying at least you know what it is. And in tequila, there were these two different classifications. There was these tequilas being made, the mixtos, with the 49% agave, uh, sorry, 49% sugars, 51% agave, and then the 100% de agave tequilas, made from 100% of agave. And the farmers didn't think it was fair, and it was very competitive in that context, where now you have these multiple different tequilas competing against each other, and now you're having to try to regulate them the same and treat them the same, but they're really different. And so with this kind of like this questioning and qualming and this conversation with the government that's been started because there's now official laws regulating it, the noms have existed, uh, the government decides that they needed someone to kind of step in and help monitor and regulate this. They can't kind of step in onto every single tequila producer and answer every single question or comment. So they created something called the CRT, the Consejo de Regulatory de Tequila. And what they do is they monitor and regulate all tequila. And today the CRT is involved in every single part of the process, every single, single step from harvest to fermentation, to distillation, to formulation, to bottling, they're there on site actually site inspecting. The inspectors and regulators are on site every single time. And we've already made another video on that if you want to watch it, the rules and regulations and economics of tequila, where you really see that the tequila regulation is involved in every single piece. This is technically the most regulated industry in the world when it comes to spirits um, nowadays. 
Back then it wasn't. And that's when this really started in 1984 is when all this regulation kind of came into press. And since then, there's been great developments. Every single time the CRT's regulations have changed in that norma, every time they meet, um, improvements have happened to the industry. So in 1994 is when Tequila finally gets their conformity assessment agency to monitor, supervise, ask questions, and to work as a facilitator between the government and the tequila producers, as well as the tequila industry as a whole and the rest of the world. And then um, in 2019, great, great bit of history for our company, uh, Hiatus Tequila is launched. Um, young little brand, uh, Spitfire brand, uh, with a very clean product, no additives, all pure, all natural. Um, and then in 2020, we have today. So there's a long history with tequila. And a lot of it comes from a very warring, troubling past. But it also helped create the supply and demand, the want, and the cultural ties to the product itself. Tequila has been growing since the 200s pre-Aztec, moving through multiple different classifications of civilization and different types of people, all the way up until the modern today mix of individuals that live in Mexico that represent themselves culturally and identify as Mexicans. And this leads to what tequila is today, as well as helped develop some of the largest consumers of tequila in the industry, the American civilization and the population. Now, my friends, that's really the history of tequila. But if you give me a couple seconds, I kind of want to harp a little bit and talk to you a little bit about who we are as Hiatus Tequila. Just to kind of give you a ballpark. Um, so once again, my name is Garrett, and I'm the brand ambassador for Hiatus Tequila. And I come from New York City. And it's a pleasure and honor to be able to work with my company. We're a very small brand, and like you just saw, we launched in 2019. So we are a baby, baby brand. But we're in multiple markets. We're in New York, we're in Florida, we're in Missouri, we're in Indiana. And you can order us uh, world... Uh, not worldwide yet, but you can order us at least countrywide in the United States for now. Um... And our products are all about the purity and essence of fruit. Our owner, um, he grew up going between Mexico and Texas. And he would do business back and forth with his family. And the whole time they were drinking these small, regional, local tequilas. And then when he came back to the U.S. years, years later, and he started tasting tequila, he realized that the industry has really changed. And the tequilas he was tasting do not taste like tequila, at least as he knew it. And for him, it was a real shock. And it stayed with him for most of his life until eventually he got tired of working for the big companies he was working for and decided to do something that made him happy. And it took him a while to figure out what that was. He went down to Mexico and spent some time with his mom in Mexico. And in doing so, he was on his hiatus. And while he was on his hiatus, he realized that, you know what, I want to do something that makes me happy. And what was that? Well, he wanted to make a tequila. So he decided to make a tequila. And in doing so, we created Hiatus Tequila. It's a very clean brand made in a Mexican flavor profile to be more appealing to the American market with its packaging and branding, but at the same time to have no additives and no artificial ingredients to be as natural as possible and really bring the spirit and heart of that original Mexican tequila back to the forefront of the people. And that's what Hiatus really does. It's a break from the norm. It's a break from the current industry. When you taste American tequila, it tends to be very stringent and sharp, that kind of burny, burny, stingy sting. Good tequila is not like that. In Mexico, you can open a bottle and they pass it around. It's a celebratory thing. It's not something that you like. You squinch and singe and burn and, or have the tequila face. Like there is no tequila face in Mexico. That's a very American thing. The ka, you know. At one point in time, tequila, yeah, it was really harsh, but tequila has developed a lot from then. And in Mexico, tequila is really great. And there's so many tequilas that are made down there that you never see across the border. There's roughly 1,600 brands being made, and a lot of them never make it across the border for multiple reasons, including proofing laws. But Hiatus Tequila is a great representation of Mexican, good, clean Mexican tequila. And I hope that you guys get to have a chance to experience it. Um, it's in a great price point, and at the same time, it's very approachable. The Blanco is very smooth. It has kind of like a grassy, green, black, uh, grassy uh, sweetness to it. It also has like kind of a black table pepper expression that goes across it with a long, lingering finish. It's very broad and wide. It's something you can literally sip out of a glass and enjoy and really taste agave. Um, the Reposado, it's aged for six months in bourbon barrels, so there's a little bit of color on it. Uh, it tends to be more appealing to kind of, you know, your whiskey drinker, your bourbon drinker, but still it's great for your tequila drinker. And our Reposado is not really, really sweet, which some of them do become. Um, ours has a touch of kind of like a roasted red bell pepper sweetness, um, a touch of caramel, a touch of butterscotch, all the kind of touch of notes that you expect in a Reposado, but without being overpowering. Agave comes full forward in front first, and then it develops into kind of those sweet, kind of like subtle pinging notes in the background. And then last, we have our Añejo, which is aged a year and a day. And it's a wonderful product as well. Um, and ex-bourbon barrels, uh, we keep it very young. The industry average on Añejo is roughly about 18 months. Um, so we keep it a year and a day. Very, very young when it comes to the aging requirements of Añejo from being from one year to three years. Um, but what that does is it keeps agave forward. 
And so you can really still taste agave with it opening into that little bit of sweetness that you get with the caramel notes, the vanilla notes, a little bit of the kind of the nutty note of kind of like the nutmeg. Um, but it's a very clean, clean product. And everyone tends to enjoy it. I enjoy drinking it myself. Uh, and I'm a kind of tequila nerd. I've been in the industry for four years now working in tequila. Not in a brand, but just in tequila. And I really do like this one. So my friends, I hope if you have time, you can try to find hiatus and taste it. Um, and this is just who we are. We're very simple. It's, it's how we do things. It's who we are. And we're very open and transparent. There's no hidden secrets. And there's no artificial ingredients. It's done all naturally, all the right way. And on top of our product itself, it's also gluten-free and kosher certified and then um it's also fully sustainable so when we make our tequila unlike a lot of the big distilleries we actually have fields where the tequila grow and so the fibers are used and reused back into this fertilizer into soil or they're sold to someone to be used for like paper or something in another industry uh so that everything is fully sustainable and there's almost no carbon footprint because of that and we're very proud of that fact you know we do care about the environment and um we're all about minimal impact and keeping things natural and clean so Thank you, my friends, and I appreciate your time, and thank you for watching us here on the Hiatus Tequila YouTube channel. Please like, comment, and subscribe, as well as hit the bell icon down in the box below uh, so that you get notified of when we're doing more live streams, as well as we're working on a couple different YouTube channel kind of topics, so, uh, one of them is being like a Let's Talk, and um, we hope to get to see you guys again soon, and hopefully this was a little bit educational for you, a little informative. And I hope you guys had some fun with it. Uh, I had a great time making the presentation, and I really do love the story of tequila. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a spirit that has been long growing, as opposed to some that just kind of popped up. Um, which is a good story too, but with tequila seeing that passion and that history behind it, it really gives you a little bit more respect for the product and where it comes from. Those deep, deep, deep pre-Hispanic roots of Mexico. Um, all the way to 200 CE, which is absolutely crazy. Uh, but yeah, friends. So once again, my name is Garrett, and thank you so much for the presentation. I hope you guys enjoy.